Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first webinar of our Food and Drink Feature Month in association with the Food and Drink Federation, the Food and Drink Exporters Association, DEFRA, UKTI, and the Grocer. My name is Gemma Price, and I am the Content and Community Manager at Open to Export. For those of you that are new to our webinars, Open to Export is a free online community where UK businesses come together to help each other become better, smarter, and more confident doing business abroad. Now, we're proud to be supported by our founding partners, UK Trade and Investment, the Federation of Small Businesses, the Institute of Export and Yale Group. So if you haven't already, uh, I would encourage you to visit opentoexport.com. Uh, food and drink continues to be one of our most vibrant and engaged sectors on the site where we have an excellent food and drink feature page, which you should all see now. Uh, it's packed with webinars, guides, case studies, and live feeds of food and drink relevant content from our forum, our events listings, and our UKTI business opportunities feed. So one of the most popular aspects of Open to Export is our discussion forum, uh, which so far has helped businesses just like yours with over 200 food and drink export questions. So if you do come away from this session with a bit of inspiration and a burning question, you can post it on our forum and get some free support from the community. Popular topics include how to find distributors or dealing with regulation um, or arranging export documentation. So we have an excellent lineup of speakers for you today. Uh, chairing this session will be Steve Barnes, who is the Economics and Commercial Services Director at the Food and Drink Federation. And Steve will be giving us an insight into the opportunities and benefits of exporting. Steve will then interview Michael Evans, who is the Export Director of Vesian, and Claire Jackson, the Business Development Lead at Eat Natural and also Peter Martin, the Business Development Director at Brokers Gin. So after the presentation and the interviews, we'll have a live Q&A session where our panel will take your questions. So you can ask a question at any point uh, using the question box on the control panel, which is situated in the right hand side of your screen. Uh, we'll get through as many of these as possible at the end of the presentation and we'll follow up with any outstanding questions after the webinar. Finally, don't worry about taking any notes. As always, we'll be recording this one and we'll upload it to our YouTube channel where you, you will find all of our previous webinars and that's youtube.com forward slash open to exports. So that'll go up in the next couple of days. So without further ado, over to Steve to get things started. Steve, are you with us? I am and good afternoon everybody who's joining us today. Um, first of all, uh, you may, may have noticed I look a little bit older than that picture you just displayed, so I'm not quite sure where that picture came from, but it's at least 10 years old. Uh, but what I thought I'd do is just spend a couple of minutes before we really get to uh, the meat of the session, just explaining a little bit about the benefits of exporting food and drink and um, you know, what are the opportunities. So if we just move on a slide, um, food and drink is obviously Britain's biggest manufacturing industry, and we're very proud that it is. It employs 400,000 people four times as many as the aerospace sector, and our gross value added, i.e. what we're worth to the economy, is two and a half times that of the UK motor industry. So we're a big industry. The majority of businesses, the vast majority in our industry, are small and medium sized, and we're hugely innovative. We bring to the market 16,000 new products every year as an industry. That's a fantastic figure, and we're also the home for many multinationals UK, uh, research centers worldwide. So the UK is really a home of innovation. But let's have a look and move on a slide at what the opportunities are overseas. I think the first thing to say is I suspect many of you on the call will realize that the UK domestic market is tough right now. Over a five year period, we haven't really seen retail sales volume growth in food and drink. But in paradox, we've actually seen some fantastic growth in value added sales of food and drink exports. So 45% growth in value over the last five years. So whilst we see, if you look at the chart, the red line is what we've been doing in food and drink uh, on export growth, and the blue line is domestic. So you see the real opportunity there is to grow uh, exports in the UK, from the UK. And if you look at the bar chart, um, what that effectively says is the proportion of the value of an industry that is accounted for by exports. So in Ireland it's 40%, in Spain it's 38%, 
By way of contrast in the UK, it's 20%. So there's a lot of room for us to go for as an industry collectively and a huge opportunity. Right now, one in five food and drink manufacturers actively export and today we're going to hear from three who are doing so but they are in the minority so there's a great opportunity still for more companies to take the exporting opportunity and internationalize their operations and doing so hopefully manage some of the risk inherent with a, a static UK economy and just to share something with you uh, if we look at the next slide uh, the figures at the top are growth year on year for the first six months of this year in food and non-alcoholic drinks and actually what we see is growth of 4.8%, 5%. In a market like the UK where there is no volume growth, there is some growth coming through from international opportunities. Great opportunities outside of the EU but also still growth in EU markets. And I'm delighted to say we'll shortly be updating our 10 steps to export success. That goes live on the Open to Export website at the end of this month. So if you haven't downloaded last year's copy, next year's copy will shortly be available. Um, that's all I really wanted to share uh, in terms of a bit of background, because really what I'm sure you all want to hear from is those guys who are out there doing it day in, day out. Um, so Claire, if it's all right if I start with you, um, and if we just move on to the next slide. Claire, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your company, Claire? Um, hello, good afternoon. My name's Claire Jackson. I'm the Export Business Development Manager for Eat Natural. I was brought in uh, last year to look after our growing um, export sales. So a uh, brief overview of Eat Natural. We make delicious bars of fruits and nuts down at our makery. That's what we call our factory. Um, and we're very proud of sourcing the best possible ingredients to go in those. Um, and we also make a range of uh, beautiful, crispy, crunchy breakfasts as well. OK, thanks, Claire. Um, Michael, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, um, Michael Evans. I'm the export director of, sort of the Sarnen PLC, um, but uh, in the UK we trade as the Sarnen UK, and we have uh, four brands under our banner, which include Callow Rice Cakes, Clipper Teas, Whole Earth uh, Spreads and Drinks, and Blue Diamond uh, Almond Breeze. So um, I'm responsible for taking the uh, Almond Breeze as a licensed brand, so we take Callow, Clipper, and Whole Earth out into international markets. Just out of interest, Michael, how, how long have you been doing this for? Well, I started off with Clipper when it was a family business. Uh, Clipper was acquired two years ago by Vassan and then came under the Vassan and Halo. So I've been looking after international sales for Clipper for the last nine years. Oh, fantastic. So some great experience we, to call. We now sell out to 53 countries around the world. Brilliant. Okay, and Peter, the, the same question to you. Tell us a bit more about yourself and your company by way of introduction. Okay. Uh, well, my name is Peter Martin. I'm the Business Development Director for Brokers Gin. Uh, I've been with brokers a relatively short time, but I've been in the wine and spirit industry for just over 30 years. Uh, working across a whole range of different spirit categories uh, and always working on export. Beef Eater Gin itself, the brand is 15 years old, but the recipe that we use is a classic or traditional London dry gin, which is a 200-year-old recipe and is still made in a 200-year-old distillery uh, just outside Birmingham. Uh, by category, we are a London dry gin. We follow all the rules statute by the EU of making a London dry gin. And we're price positioned uh, around about the Tanqueray mark, just under Bombay Sapphire, which is normally the market leader uh, in the premium gin sector in most markets. And we also export to about 50 countries around the world. Okay, so does London Dry Gin have a protected name status? Is that how that works? Not, London uh, does not have a protected status, but the method of making it and therefore calling it a London does. So there's an EU statute on how you can make it, what ingredients uh, are required, um, whereas some modern gins today are putting in added ingredients and added flavours, and they can't call themselves a London gin because they're popping outside of that uh, method. Okay, brilliant. 
So if I just ask some general questions now, if that's okay, and, and hopefully that will tease out questions from those um, listening in, uh, which we can pick up at the end uh, of the session. Um, so I, I suppose a basic introduction, really. If I start with you again, Claire, if that's okay, what, what have been the benefits of exporting for your business? You know, what's it changed in your business? Um, I think uh, first and foremost we're now a uh, global brand if you look back several years we were very much UK centric um, and now you can find our bars and cereals in over 30 countries worldwide um, we've recruited new people including me to um, to look after export it's um, a major part of our growth um, our growth now um, and we're expanding our makery as well to increase our capacity um, so it's a it's a major feature for us now. And, and your makery, as you call it, will always be based in the UK. Yes. Yep. And so no plans for change. Okay then. Uh, same question, really, Michael. You know what what's it what's it meant to your business? What does it mean to your business? Um, well, it's been pivotal to um, to one of the reasons why the Sun and acquired acquired the brand. Um, in, to get some presence in a much stronger presence in mainland Europe. Um, as a as a brand, it's uh, what, 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 from the point of view of Clipper, we haven't actually seen any downturn or recession, um, even through the 2008-2009 financial crisis. Uh, from our figures from 2007 through to 2013, are uh, an export compound annual growth rate of 25%. Um, so effectively growing by 25% every year. Um, that's resulted in actually the Sun in investing two million pounds in capital expenditure at our factory in Dorset. Um, and you know, since I live in Dorset, it protects jobs in what is very much a rural area of England, and that's where we uh, manufacture the tea. Okay, I know it well. Um, just therefore, 25% compound growth. I mean, effectively, that means you must be doubling the value of Clipper every just under three years, is it? Yes, correct. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that, you know, and exports have been key in that. Well, that's certainly an endorsement yeah. of doing it, isn't it? Yes. Okay, Peter. Yeah. Um, same as well, really. I mean, what, what do exports mean to you as a company? Well, we feel the benefit of building the brand um, overseas is, is growing the brand awareness and the brand equity that we have. I mean, it's a common phrase that the world is getting smaller, and to have brand uh, visibility in multiple markets can, can really only be a benefit. It also helps to negate seasonality, um, because here in the UK, most alcohol is consumed at Christmas, um, whereas in other markets it's consumed at summer. Um, so we don't have the peaks and troughs of uh, seasonality just in the UK. Uh, it gives us potential for a higher prices and profitability where distribution costs may be lower, um, where um, retailers or, or wholesalers are taking slightly less of a margin. And it moves across international economies also, sort of avoiding the pitfalls of localized recessions. So it balances out your, your business and your portfolio and avoids those peaks and troughs of seasonality. And That's of course, you can also. It can also sort of reduce your cost to the economies of scale, but that you have to be very careful on because it can be negated by individual market demands on, on exclusive labeling. So whereas you think you'll be exporting the same product, um, you're not always doing that. And different label changes, different uh, uh, required mandatories on the label may, may make you actually make more SKU. So you have to balance that as well. No, I mean it's fascinating when you combine all the interest, all, all the answers. It, it really is about managing risk, and uh, you know I love the point about seasonality, Peter. It's not one that ever crossed my mind before, but clearly it's very important in terms of production. If it, I could wind for, yeah, your... for production, yeah, and and also for um, our time and, and money, you can spread yourself across a year rather than just running around like a headless chicken at Christmas. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I understand that. Just if I could wind you all back a, a little bit. Um, and I don't know whether you're able to answer the question if, if you weren't there at the start of a journey, but do, do you know why your organization started exporting? What was the sort of catalyst to do so? Because I, I think there'll be people on the, on the webinar who are considering taking the first step in the journey. So, you know, what, what was the catalyst for you to do that? So, Claire, 
have you any insight of what it was like at Eat Natural, what, what it might have been? Yeah, I think um, the the opportunity to to export for them was to for, was to be able to to grow the brand and and increase sales. And it started with our co-founders um, several years ago, uh, driving out to uh, Germany for a trade fair, and uh, they had the the cheap seats right next to the the men's toilets. And I think we're uh, just about to pack up right at the very end when a a large uh, Dutch uh, Dutchman came across and ate uh, a number of the bars in one go, inhaled them almost, and then placed an order. So um, I think uh, the, it started with the cheap seats uh, for us at a, a trade fair, and it's it's grown from there really. So it was as simple as the right man in the right time and the right show. Exactly. Which yeah. Might have been a catalyst to all that's followed. Fantastic, Mike, yeah. Michael. Any insight in terms of a Clipper story? Yeah, I mean, it's fairly similar in terms of obviously as the brand grew in the UK, we received international inquiries into the business. Um, but then we actually sat down and said, right, okay, if we are going to sell into international markets, what are the markets we want to sell into? Um, which are our strategic markets? So we, that was the roadmap in terms of we set ourselves uh, five strategic markets, which actually encompassed about 14 countries. So when I say a strategic market, it'd be Scandinavia, but it included Finland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Iceland uh, would be included in the Scandinavian bloc. Um, and then we concentrated on finding the best partner in those markets, uh, someone with the same passion, the same enthusiasm, and the same tenacity to get what is a tea brand onto the shelf in a very competitive fixture. Um, There's some big players in tea. Uh, we all know about the likes of Lipton and Twinings. And, um, you know, we wanted someone with passion and enthusiasm could take that message to those markets. So how did um, potential distributors demonstrate that passion? What did you, what did you see that made, them, made you believe yeah. they were committed to your brand? Well, I mean, I think yeah, but there's obviously the obvious questions about what structure and, and, and what sort of business they have behind them, um, you know, in terms of the support that they can give the brand. Um, but then also it's, it's, it's about, with international sales, it is about getting to know these owners as well. And often it can be gut feel, to be honest. It, it can actually be down to that. But, um, but there needs to be some backing behind it because you can have some full starts in international markets and you can be facing some really unusual demands. So I think you have to be very clear at the start what you can do and what you can't do. Okay, brilliant. And Peter, your, your view on why did you go down the exporting route? What, what was the catalyst to start you on that route? Well, actually, um, it's not unusual for people in the spirit industry to create an export brand rather than a home market brand. Um, the, the, the UK market is, is very difficult to, to crack. It's dominated by the supermarkets um, in the retail. There are very few uh, wine and spirit shops compared to other uh, independent wine and spirit shops compared to other markets. And the, the supermarkets control about 65 to nearly 70 percent of, of uh, wines and spirits. And they kind of suppress prices and they have quite high margins. So it's not unusual for uh, a spirit company to export first, and in fact, that's what Brokers did. Brokers was um, created mainly for export, um, and in fact, the export market has been so successful, or export markets have been so successful, that we're now created as a demand here in the UK, and the entry into the UK has not been as difficult as it would have been had we started in the UK. So we, we've done it in the reverse, really. So it's almost as if we plan to have three completely different um, ways of approaching the export market. The, the slightly ad hoc, if you'll excuse me, Claire, approach of Eat Natural, the strategic plan uh, of s &N, and obviously an export-led company uh, with yourself, Peter. So three completely different approaches, yes. which hopefully provide some of those listening in on, on, with some insight. Um, just to vary the order a little bit, so if I start with you on this one, Peter, um, what have been the biggest barriers you've found when exporting and, and you know, any tips for how you've overcome those? The barriers? Um, the barriers to export is really getting to, to know the markets. 
Um, you know, once you've identified, which I think is one of the other questions coming up, once you've identified the, the market where you are, is then finding out how you, you get into that market. Once we, once we um, sort out our own pricing and positioning of brokers where we see it amongst an international competitive set, which is very much for us between uh, Tanqueray, which is made by a huge company called Diageo, and Bombay Sapphire, which is made by another huge company, Grant. We're, we're sort of in the middle of those two. And we bring that to every market. And if we see there is a gap in that market for a, a brand at that price point, um, we will go for it. But the, the difficulties of doing that is, to, is whether the market actually does have um, a segment big enough to take another brand within that price point, whether we can find uh, a distributor or an importer that has the right passion for us that's not already taken by other international gins. And what we found in our industry with importers, years ago the, there were many, many mid-size importers, but now it's, you either go with a huge one or a small one, and the mid-size ones have all been gobbled up by the big boys. So you, you either become brand number 500 on somebody's list or you're brand number three on somebody's list, but the size of those companies looking after you are very, very different. So you have to work out whether the passion that that small person has will make up for the lack of um, backing that he has in, in their company in terms of marketing support and sales support. So there, there are two, two big barriers. One is, the, is does the segment exist, and two, who it is that we can use to, um, to, to actually penetrate that market. And then, of course, with alcohol, you do have a lot of uh, regulations, health regulations, um, to do with where you can drink alcohol and how you can drink alcohol. But that, that's pretty much the same in any market that you go in these days. So that's, that's, a, that's a common thing. Okay. No, and it's interesting that the word passion comes up again. Uh, Claire, so same question to you. I mean, what, what are the biggest barriers that uh, you come across and how do you overcome those? Um, I think uh, very similar to, to what Peter says. I think first I'd call them challenges rather than, than barriers. Um, but uh, different com countries have completely different cultures. So um, we've learned that you can't have a, um, a one size fit all strategy for for the different countries and you really have to to get to understand um, the culture and the market and and where you're going to position yourself in that market um, labeling customs requirements they take a they take a lot of time and, and effort and I think especially the first uh, couple of orders that you um, send out to a to a new country as well there's definitely teething uh, problems along the way um, but it's all all worth it in the end okay well that's good to hear and, and obviously it's a very good point that food is a response to culture um, and, and well made uh, Michael Vesson then um, same question yeah. really uh, what are the challenges and, and have you handled them yeah I mean uh, you know there's lots of barriers out there and they can be at a local level they can be at a regional level or they can be at um, you know just relating to the food um, I think we're improving um, as a nation in terms of having free trade agreements uh, with various parts of the world which has helped um, you know as particularly some of the food companies export more um, all of the barriers are none of them are insurmountable and actually, once you work through those and over those, um, you can be rewarded quite effectively with with some good profitable business for you know for you know for your company. So uh, yes, it can appear a bit challenging to to someone just setting out on the journey. So I think if they're if they're considering exporting, I think perhaps they should export to the slightly easier markets to, that we can trade in. So. Um, you know, but don't go for Japan straight away or something like that. So. No, no, understood. So, I mean, just just following on from that, you know, if some of these problems seem insurmountable or certainly very, very time consuming. I'll go back to you, Michael, and ask Claire and Peter in a second. What, what sort of outside help have you had and where would you point people listening in for outside help? If, if you've had that, where, where would you direct people? Michael to go. Um, yeah, uh, f purely from a regulatory point of view, we use Leatherhead Institute for, for, uh, who manage um, food, and, food and drink labelling. 
uh, to to do any checks uh, within a marketplace on maybe or maybe on on the actual product itself, would it be in the ingredients? Can you sell those ingredients in that market? Um, in terms of the wider legislation about what you know the customs duties, regulations, tariffs for marketplace, certainly what I've noticed over the last six to seven years is that all of the British MC trade advisors have been actively getting behind food and drink exports because they are outperforming Britain's exports and very much will um, will help you on your journey to exporting to a new market. Uh, we have some embassies around the world which are very particularly supportive of uh, serving clipper teas at good, good events and things like that. So, so that's what I would say is, is two points of call that you could you call, call on. I think it's a really good point as well. I mean, you know, the, the current government have made very clear uh, commercial success is a priority for all the embassies, and, and there really is a resource to draw on, which, which isn't necessarily that high profile, I, I don't think, but it is there, isn't it, and, Michael? And not that costly either. No, excellent. Uh, Claire, uh, where would you look for support? Um, I think uh, the same. I, I found um, UK trade and investment uh, hugely beneficial since joining the company uh, last September. Um, being able to uh, speak to trade advisors around the world, um, they've been able to uh, link us up with um, with the retail with retailers or coffee chains that we've um, we've wanted to um, to get appointments with, um, which has been great. Um, and they have a number of um, of programs that have been uh, really good as well. So they often have uh, meet the buyer events in the UK. Uh, they'll have export led uh, discussion days, and all of those are really useful. It's um, it's good to get along and speak to other people that are doing the the same thing. So how did you sort of first discover UKTI? Who who is your point of call? Do you have a, a representative who services you specifically, Claire? Yeah, yeah, I have um, a trade advisor in in London um, that I s um, set up with. Um, I speak to him uh, quite regularly. Uh, he passes me on information um, for contacts uh, in different countries for events that are going on in UK, and also looking at um, UK uh, trade missions that are going on as well that hopefully we'll join in the future. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a, I agree. It's a great um, resource to draw on. And, and Peter, same to you. I mean, where have you been looking for assistance, and have you found it forthcoming and, and valuable? Yeah, very much. Um, again, the uh, UK trade and industry. We we have a contact um, with somebody who used to be an old colleague, actually, in, in the wine and spirit trade. So he understands our business completely, and uh, he's been very helpful. Uh, we've used him in uh, Europe and uh, Asia, so that's, that's been good. Uh, I don't think you can underestimate the, the old networking either um, with like-minded companies. Um, with people in our, our company have been in the business quite a long time. We have a lot of uh, friends and ex-colleagues in the marketplace who might be on different wines or different spirits, non-competing. And uh, we speak regularly to find out um, you know, what's going on in the market, uh, our distributors moving, our brands moving, just to um, sort of lay out the, the future of what's happening. And that, that um, that networking can really help you at times as well. Uh, market visits, I don't think um, you, can, you can really export without getting out there. Uh, investigate distribution chains in the business, have a look at, for, for us anyway, to look at the bars, ask the bars about what's selling through, um, speak to wholesalers and uh, speak to, to other importers as well. So market visits, networking I think is just as important as um, official um, stops. And trade journals as well. We have a lot of trade journals uh, in the wine and spirit trade. Some are pure data, like international wine and spirit records, but they'll give you a lot of information in markets. Um, and also uh, journalists. Journalists know what's going on. Um, so we, we use a whole range of, um, of avenues to, uh, to try and overcome whatever the barrier might be, whether it's uh, an import tariff problem or, or whether it's just finding a distributor problem. Okay. I mean, some excellent tips there, and, and clearly, companies exporting, you, you do often find uh, people are prepared to help if it's a non-competing category and offer advice, as you're doing so in this session. Just oh, a very absolutely. practical, 
just as a very practical question, when, when you're looking for a distributor, you know, if you were to say the two things you need most from a distributor, aside from passion, shall we take that as a given, what are the two things you, you absolutely need from a distributor? And let's start with Claire, if that's okay. Oh, so you've uh, you've taken that one off me, Steve. I was going to say the first the first and most important thing for us is um is somebody that we can have in our eat natural family and somebody that say, shares the same values uh, with us and that we can that we can develop a really successful relationship with. Um, so do you go for a really long term relationship, Claire? Is that the definite? Element? Whoever you choose is there for the long term. Definitely. I mean, we've um, we've just had our uh, Swedish importers over uh, to to the makery, and um, they've been working f with us for for ten years now. So it's a really long, established relationship, and and they've grown as as we've grown, and we have a we have a great relationship with them, and we're we're continuing to develop that that market with them. Okay. So Michael, I'm going to change the question slightly you you obviously yeah. select I've been involved in selecting a lot of distributors I'm guessing over time what are the things to watch yeah. out for that do not would not work for you yeah I mean that's a, I mean obviously you learn as as um, as the years go by from uh, from past mistakes we all learn I think uh, you have to make sure that uh, um, when well, the one thing we've started doing is is really qualifying who we're speaking to. Uh, so you will get lots of inquiries from various parts of the world, and some of them look quite promising and everything else. And um, and and you know the last line is, can we have a price list? But we don't actually send price lists out. We send a questionnaire back to them, which has a whole series of questions about um, who who we're talking to. Uh, so we want to know what this business is, what's behind it, what brands they represent, what they've done with it. Um, you know, I see a distributor as a custodian of the brand in that country, and they are an extension of the marketing department that's based here in the UK, they're an extension of the sales department that's based in the UK, they're an extension of the logistics department, uh, they're an extension of the whole business. So. We encourage them to, to visit Dorset, visit our factory, so they understand, you know, the passion and enthusiasm and the the way we go about sourcing our teas, the quality of our teas. So, so they have a full, they're fully immersed in the brand, and that's what you're looking for: is someone who can immerse themselves in the brand and really take it on board as if you're, you know, you're handing over a small child to them to look after and nurture. And do you do you check on their performance? Do you talk to the the guys that are out Every walking to the time, Yes, all the time. They we have. Yes, it's not all about friendly dinners and things like that. But we have an agreed business plan uh, that we have to um, that we agree three months before the year end for the following year, and we challenge them throughout the year as to where they are on that business plan, and if they haven't delivered the business plan that you both agreed we've let them down as well it's we both okay. have to put our hands up and say why haven't we achieved what we're looking for this year and look at a way of fixing it so is it the same in the wines and spirits sector peter i mean it, or you know yeah, very you... much i mean it, to, to answer the first question that you posed to claire um for us as well it, you know there is a financial element to these risks and uh, checking on people's creditworthiness uh, one of them, mm -hmm. um, finding um, uh, finding a, a credit house that will give you some information on them, or again through networking, um, find out the credit worthiness. We, but we also look at their range of products to make sure they're complementary. Um, if they're cheap and cheerful products, which is you know a, a very good trade if you're in it, but we're not. Um, we don't want to be the only premium product in, in their range equally. Are working the other way, so we, we make sure that their range of products are complementary to ours. We also make sure that there's nothing that conflicts, because some importers are just brand collectors, and they'll have three, uh, three or four brands all on the same price point, which I think is um, very difficult then to get the focus on your brand. Um, we, uh, a bit like uh, Michael said, we have a kind of scorecard system, so we will go back to them and ask them various questions on what brands they have what successes they've had in the market and give some examples 
and then we also ask for a reference from one of the other companies uh, that they represent and we'll contact that reference and uh, check all those answers uh, with them and then we'll make up an internal I'll make up an internal scorecard um, what is the size of their sales department do they cover all the trade channels that we want in terms of our business are they on trade or off trade at the bars or retail um, are they enthusiastic are we, do we also go and visit the market um, we ask people in the trade who would be dealing with them um, for an opinion and uh, you find that a lot of bars will talk about wholesalers and wholesalers will talk about importers. So we, we build up a picture over time of, of um, whether they're suitable for our brand and, and then we'll go with them. So in all instances, what, well, what I hear is be very careful about who is going to be custodian of your brand. Make well, exactly. sure you know as much as, yeah. as you can about them uh, and then hopefully you'll build a long-term mutually profitable relationship. But the need is to keep checking and making sure they're delivering their side of the bargain. Yeah, um, and just to make sure know. they have the right coverage in the market that you want as well for whichever trade channel that your brand is, is good for. Um, some, some In our business, some companies are very good for bar business but not very good for retail business and you have to get the balance right. Okay, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I don't know whether you're prepared to share too much on this but um, maybe start with you Claire. What, what do you see as the next steps? I mean. You, Everyone's talking about how beneficial exports has been to the business, but what are the next steps? Where are you going next? What do you, you know, is it about new markets? Is it about better share in existing markets? Is it fewer markets and bigger shares? What, what next in what you can share, Claire? Um, yeah, okay. I think um, more countries, please, is, uh, is what we're looking at at the moment. We'd like to, uh, to expand our, our brand globally, but I think um, it's important that we and consolidate the markets that we um, that we currently have and and establish ourselves well in in mainland Europe where we do well so um, it's a it's a mixture of both for us really um, bringing on new markets where we see opportunities and where the snack bar market is is growing and also I work with our long established uh, importers to make sure we're making the most of opportunities in in their markets with them okay thank you Claire uh, Michael you know what, what next for you um, it, well there's a there's a number of next steps and it, obviously where we where we have a significant presence in the marketplace um, we're, we're moving our sort of expenditure um, slightly away from the distributor towards the consumer so uh, to give you an example we developed a French website German website Dutch website and Japanese website last year so those all went live last year so we can communicate with the clipper consumers in those markets in the language that they speak um, and uh, and then the other thing we're doing um, in terms of next steps is uh, you know the reality is of the situation we're in at the moment is that mainland Europe is uh, is not expected to show any significant levels of growth in the next couple of years and so we're trying to um, sort of change the pie chart of our of our exports which currently is 60% Europe and 40% elsewhere to try and move that towards a more of a 50-50 split okay uh, ambitious plans and fascinating about the website absolutely you know a real I think an endorsement of success you must have had to be in a position to do that. And Peter, what about yourself? And, and well, where do you think you'll be good? I mean, as they say, if you if you start building a fire, you've got to fuel it um, to keep it going. And uh, brokers, fortunately, is, is within the gin segment, which is probably the hottest uh, wine and spirit segment in the world at the moment. Um, it's probably coming over here as well. And in, to make sure that we benefit from that um, uh, category. Uh, we have expanded our sales and turnover. Um, we, we immediately increased the staffing level, uh, more um, people on the ground to, to get out to the markets and uh, to meet and to agree and to plan with the importers. Um, we've looked at markets which are beyond our traditional or our, our core investment markets, which for us was, uh, was North America. Both America and Canada were, were great markets in the beginning for us, and, and again, growth of between 35 and 45% year on year. Um, but 
we're trying to shift away from from that as well. We're probably about 65% um, relied on on them, and so we're now doing a lot of work in Spain, which is a big gin market in New Zealand, Germany, and and actually, as I mentioned earlier, here in the UK. Um, whereas before we would we were produced in the UK and available if somebody wanted it. Now we're we're really working well with a, a distributor in the UK is getting us into the right uh, channels of trade. Uh, we're also looking at uh, line extensions, premium line extensions, to try and uh, capture some of the premium market that's happening in gin, and how we can do that with the broker's brand, with the elasticity of the price and uh, the positioning. And um, we do a constant review and evaluation of our import partners. I, I know we said earlier that they're, they're very important, but things change. They they move around in terms of personnel. Uh, and also take on different brands which may be conflictual or they, or they lose brands which makes them less effective. So we have a constant review and evaluation of our import partners um, which we do on an annual basis as well. So it's okay, really well, just it's, uh, to maintain momentum in the successful markets and find new ones. I, I mean across all, all, all of you it seems like there are excellent opportunities provided by exports and even the reverse importing one that Peter's just highlighted. Um, a sort of last question from me to all of you, and then I'll, I'll hand back to Gemma and she can pick up any questions that have been posted whilst we've been speaking. Um, but I suppose with the guys listening in, I think that what they'd really like to know from you as individuals, you know, what are your three top tips for exporting? Well, you know, what what would you advice would you give to businesses? So what are your three top tips? Start with you, Michael. Three top tips would be. Um, a clear market focus, so understand what market you want to go for and really study that market. Understand where your brand will be in that marketplace, so what price do you want it to be on the shelf and who, is it, who, are, who are the competitors you'll be up against. Is it a realistic objective? Can you get to that price with the distributor and everything else? And then select a partner with passion and enthusiasm because you are going to ask them to look after your brand. So those are the three. Thank you very much, Michael. Claire, your, your three top tips. Um, yep, I think, uh, first of all, they're, pretty, they're going to be pretty similar to Michael's, but uh, know your customer. So that's um, know the consumer in the marketplace that you're, that you're targeting and your, your importer should be able to help you with that. Um, but also understand uh, your importer as well. The, um, as we said previously, the the other brands that they they take on board, um, the channels that they can distribute your your product to. Um, I'd say know the culture as well. Um, understand um, understand the culture of the the country that you're going to import in. Um, where your where your product uh, fits in for them. So, uh, for our bars, is that um, are we looking at sporty people? Are we looking at culture that already um, already snacks? Um, and finally, be be confident. You have you, we know we have an excellent product and um, people enjoy it. So um, we can be confident taking it out to new markets and be confident with your choice of of importer too. So confidence, passion, courage of convictions. Peter, what were your three? Be? Well, strangely enough, all very similar. Um, <laughs> but I think, for, for us anyway, it's make sure that your, your product is, is fit for sale because I think some people who may have excess stock or excess capacity just think, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll now look at um, export markets. But that doesn't always work because the, the branding might not be right, the message might be mixed because of the language on the label. Um, make sure that so make sure that product is fit for export as opposed to just being something that you used to sell here in the UK, and make sure that the consumers in that export market understand it and and uh, the labelling and everything is correct and the messages the subliminal messages on the um, labelling are, are there um, to ensure again that you have the best import partner that fits your product uh, and and your company uh, make sure the cultures are the same and they share your your passion and brand aspiration. And then there's a point that Michael made, get your pricing and positioning correct and stick to it because the worst thing in the world is to be cheap in one market and expensive in another and, and schizophrenic brands, they, they rarely succeed. And, and that also helps you to have accurate uh, costings on your business as well so you can manage it better. So I, I'd say those three things. 
Okay, I mean, some fantastic tips from everyone. I, I think that's superb. Uh, Gemma, are you there? I am, yes. Thank you, Steve. Um, I'm back to you, Gemma. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, just to thank um, all of the the, the, the speakers um, as well, Michael, Claire, and Peter, and we've had um, a phenomenal response uh, from the audience um, and, and quite a number of questions. I'm going to start out with one around localization um, and brand packaging. Just before we get into the uh, the question, um, if you haven't already and you have a, a burning question for the the speakers, do please use your chat box. Do get it into us, and we will try to get to it. Um, so we've had this question in from Sue, from Bella and from Ali, um, and it's all about localization. Um, so how do you effectively deal with localizing your uh, brand and packaging, um, be that in terms of the, the labeling or, or um, the brand as a whole? Claire, if I start with you, if that's okay, how, how would you deal with that? Um, yeah, so, yeah, so um, in, in, in terms of our, of our packaging, our packaging we, keep we keep it the keep same, it the same um, uh, throughout, throughout our, markets. our markets, we don't differentiate. We, differentiate. Um, we do do some um, specific film for different countries now, so for, for France they have their, their own film and then if required we'll, we'll label for countries as well, just um, put a small label on the back. Um, it all depends on the requirements, but um, it's important for us to keep our uh, brand identity, and and so therefore the packaging will look will look the same whether you're in uh, the UK, Sweden, or Singapore. Interesting, um, very interesting. And Michael, um, do you take a similar um, response? Michael, do you take a similar approach, or do you do something differently? Um, a similar um, approach, approach initially, initially when the when the number was smaller, but um, we now have um, French packaging for the French market, German packaging, and Dutch mark packaging for for those markets, and and obviously the USA is uh, uses a different barcode system, so we have a US range which is USDA certified organic, uh, as opposed to um, European organic, so. Um, it depends on whether it's a strategic market or not. We, we're probably unlikely to develop packaging for a non-strategic market. I see. Um, I see. So prioritization of market comes into uh, into place when making those decisions. Um, Peter, yeah, yeah. just taking that question to you now. Uh, what's Brokers right, Gin's right. Um, kind of approach with dealing with localization? Well, the localization normally. For us, anyway, is is more to do with uh, the mandatories which go on the back label as opposed to the front label. Our front label packaging will always be the same. Um, we don't have. Oh, that's quite not true because in Canada, you have to have dual language labelling. So we have some French on the front label as well. Anything you put in English, you have to put in French. Uh, but outside of that, our front label will be the same. It's our back label that may change. We will certainly put on a importer's address if the importer is big enough. Um, and the mandatories for that particular market. But to, to ease some of the costs, we will put mandatories, a lot of mandatories on the back label, um, which cut across a lot of markets. And then you can use the same back label for a lot of markets, and then that cuts down on your cost on your SKUs. Um, what those mandatories would be, your local importer would help you, and customs and excise would also help you in, in our business. Uh, the brand explanation may be in a, in a, a different language. Um, we're, we're thinking of doing that now for Spain, because in Spain um, the capacity to speak English is not as big as, say, in Germany or, or in Greece or in other markets. And to get to the Spanish consumer, a little brand message on the back we may put into Spanish. But again, you have to be careful there, because a lot of people will then say it becomes a local brand as opposed to an imported brand. So. To protect your imported and brand equity, you have to be very careful on those things. But there are many, many avenues um, in terms of finding out what it needs to go on, on the back label for us um, that, that we use. But the front label is 90% is always the same. Interesting, interesting. And I'm sure that um, that will generate quite a few more questions. Um, very interesting approach there. And we do have a lot of um, spirits com um, companies in our community 
Um, so I'm sure we'll, um, there'll be a lot more in terms of labeling and localization of product to cover off. Um, just to mention that we do have um, an entire webinar coming up next week, next Thursday, same time on labeling and labeling regulations. Um, so if you haven't already, do, do take a look at that. Um, just moving on to the next question, we've had this in again from um, quite a few of our audience today. So um, Michael, Sarah and Bobby asked this one and um, it's all around choosing a market, um, be this EU versus non-EU. Um, so if a brand is getting um, a number of inquiries from a number of different, um, different markets, be that um, their efforts at trade shows or um, from their localised website, I know a couple of you have, have had websites localised localized as well. Um, how would you prioritize uh, which market to, to focus on? Um, what would be your top tip? So uh, just sticking with the order, Claire, if I could come to you, do you um, have a top tip for prioritizing markets um, uh, in terms of, of which one you go after first? Um, yeah, um, yeah, I'd say, I'd um, say um, firstly, firstly the EU is going to be one of the one easiest, easiest places that you can that trade, you can into. trade um, into, um, um, and it's also and very it's close. So getting on a plane or a train to go over there to to speak to importer or to walk the market yourself um, makes makes Europe um, uh, a great opportunity. Um, for me, it's all been all about understanding. Um, the opportunity in the market with uh, data reports as well. So, if you stood a lot of um, Euro Monitor uh, reports down in the British Library to have a look at um, snack bar segment segments as well, that's helped me to prioritise um, any um, any questions coming in about uh, new markets as well. Interesting, very interesting. Um, also that you are using the resource of the British Library, so we haven't had that come up um, in our in webinars or, or ad advice on the, on the forum previously for food and drink businesses. So I think this is a, a demonstration of why these kind of interview webinars are so powerful in terms of the, the top tips they tease from people that are, you know, in market doing it right now. Um, Michael, if I could take that same question to you, so in terms of prioritization of leads and incoming inquiries from trade shows or, or just kind of generally prioritizing which market you pursue next, do you have any, any top tips you could share? Um, no, I mean, I think, I think uh, Claire has covered, you know, the main ones. I mean, I think if, particularly if it's someone new to exporting is, is um, don't choose the trickiest market. Uh, there are still markets that, um, that uh, we allow a consolidator to service because ultimately the legislation just brings in too much complexity into this business. So it's about managing the complexity and, and if you can reach a few markets where um, there is little in the way of complexity of getting your product there, that, then that's your starting point. But and then at the same time, obviously it depends on your product. You know, is there a demand for that product in the marketplace? So. From our point of view, we look at, um, you know, what is the tea consumption in, in that market? You know, what is the size of the organic market? What is the, um, you know, per capita income? Can they actually afford the product in that marketplace? Um, so, you know, there's lots of factors. A lot of this data is available um, either through the web or through, through various sources. So, um, but it depends on what category you're in as well. Okay, okay, thank you, Michael. And just staying with you, if I could, for this next one. Uh, we've had a question from um, a company in a similar uh, category. Um, just looking at China, do you um, or any of the other panel have um, advice or experience they could share when um, dealing with China and setting up a distributor, that kind of thing? We receive a lot of people are in China. In China. China. Um, um, and quite often there there's people talking about that they've, uh, they've they want to register our brand name over there so um we don't actually trade in china at all um and uh well, part of the reason is that uh, we're an organic tea company and the, the regulations for that market um whilst we buy our tea from china we can't seem to sell it back to them 
Okay, um, thank you very much for that, Michael. Um, and we, we've just got time for one more question before we wrap up. And I think this one um, naturally would go to Peter. Um, so Peter, if I could bring you in for this one. Um, and it's all about collaboration with other brands and teaming up with um, products that complement your existing um, SKUs and, and, and range. Do you um, team up with any, for example, mixers um, or, or perhaps olives with your gin? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Um, uh, in marketing terms, we would call that brand associations, and any brand that we associate ourselves with, um, we, uh, in the same way that they would look at us, we look at them and make sure that they are the same uh, perceived quality. So for uh, gin and tonic, which is still probably 80-90% of the way that gin is consumed, um, we would team up with people like Schweppes or Fentimans um, or Fever Tree rather than going for an own label um, because the association is there on, on quality. So in terms of mixers, we do that. Um, we also do it um, with other brands. So if you go to a, to a trade show, which is um, something that hasn't really been mentioned here, but for us, trade shows are fantastic because you, you really do uh, meet people from the local market, um, particularly in the, in the wholesale trade and importer trade. But if we go to a, a trade show and the trade show is very expensive, we will team up with a high quality rum or maybe a whiskey producer that shares the same values as us um, so we can be sharing the costs and sharing all the contacts that come in without actually competing against each other. Wow, that is, um, that's very insightful and resourceful as well. Um, so great tip to share, thank you very much. Um, I think I'm just gonna take uh, one last question from the audience and I'm going to go to Claire with this one. Um, and it's all about intellectual property and registering your product in a market, um, even if you're not particularly pursuing that market right now. Um, Claire, do you guys register products in advance in markets and protect your IP in that way? What's your approach with, with IP? Um, um, this is something that we've dealt with the, by our, our technical team, um, but it is something that we review, we're reviewing all the time um, on, on protecting our um, IP. It, um, it's uh, protected in Europe and now as we expand we're looking to, to new markets and, and what we need to do in those as well. Yeah, um, fantastic and with you guys being Gemma, such a Gemma, fresh... Gemma, Gemma. Oh yes, of course. Sorry, it's Michael. Sorry, it's Michael. I just wanted to say that, say that um, um, yeah, we've, yeah we've, we've, we've obviously we've felt obviously challenges, felt challenges. Um, um, with the trademark over the years. There is a, if you Google WIPO, uh, that's the World Intellectual Property Organization, that will uh, help um, people starting out on, on uh, protecting their brand name when taking it out to international markets. There's quite a bit there. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you, Michael. And I think that's about all the time we have. So I would just like to thank um, all of our speakers again. So Steve uh, Barnes from the FTF and Claire, uh, Michael and Peter. Um, thank you very much for sharing your, your stories and your business experiences with our audience um, of, of businesses looking for inspiration. It's very much appreciated. Um, just a reminder that this webinar has been recorded and will be up on our YouTube channel where you can watch all of our webinars back. Uh, so if you're looking for some export inspiration where we have uh, a wealth of content there for you to digest at your leisure. Um, now, if you haven't um, already, do get registered on the Open to Export uh, forum and become part of our community. Registration is free and easy. And if you need advice, guidance or clarification, just post a question on our discussion forum or tweet us and we'll try and get you an answer and some free support as quickly as we can. Um, and just to say, don't miss the next webinar. It's a week from today. We have um, some excellent speakers um, and we're going to be picking their brains all about understanding food labelling for export and the new EU regulations, which I'm sure you're all aware of and you're all geared up for already. Um, so we've got the, the head of uh, DEFRA's food labelling unit and also Ashbury labelling, who I'm sure you've all heard of already. Um, and we're going to really dissect and pick away at those regulations and make sure that we're all, all ready for, for that one that comes in. 
So thank you very much for your time today, everybody. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. Goodbye.